Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about all things Arnold Jacobs all of the time. We're here in Brooklyn with, I can't believe it, I can't believe I'm sitting next to him, Mr. Lou Soloff. Amazing. Lou. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, you have credits that would take up the entire length of the interview, and uh, they're just uh, amazing. But I'm not a tuba player. That's true. We'll have to figure out... Uh, Can't play the tuba. But you did study with Arnold Jacobs. Yes, I certainly did. And so you fit. One of the greatest teachers of our life. Do you remember, uh, can you, can you uh, uh, remember, recount for, for uh, the audience your sure. initial times? I was 21 years old. I was working, uh, I'm now I'm 70. I was working, it was 1965 working Radio City Music Hall, Vince Panzarella and I both auditioned and got in at the same time, and also Mario Guarnari, who uh, became the first trumpet out in, I think it was LA for a while, or it became, I, I can't remember which orchestra he was in, I think it was Los Angeles, he was there for a long time. I don't know if he was first associate first, what he was, but at any rate, we worked there together a lot, and Vince and I became very good friends. And he would always, when I, when the blood, sweat, and tears thing happened to me, which was in 1968, uh, I joined in the spring of 68, and I think we did our first tour probably over the summer or the fall, I can't remember which one. But Vince told me about. Jake and said that when I, if I went to Chicago, I should definitely get a lesson with him. And how Jake had saved his, basically, uh, life, trumpet speak, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, I mean, as far as like, not his physical life, but as far as him being able to play ever again. And told me all about his accident and all that. And Vince and I are still very good friends. Anyway, I'll prefer it by saying that um, I don't think probably anybody has anything more important to say about Jake than probably what Vince does. I wasn't in big trouble when I went to see him. I was 25 years old when I saw him. So. I'd been on the road, I know now that it was probably in the winter or spring of 66. It's insane. Yeah. No, not, not 66, of uh, 1969. 69. Right. When the record had just hit, had just become very big. It was it's, important, Will. it's important that I say that because of other things that Jake told me. Hmm. Um, I was, frankly, at that point in my life, and uh, you know, if you go and cut this, you can cut it, but I smoked pot for four years in my life, maybe a little less, but I can't tell you for sure if it was 1968 to 72, or if it was 69 to 73. Mm -hmm. But I loved it, and I smoked basically every day. And um, I, I will go on record as saying I think it's a relatively harmless drug. But on the other hand, it didn't mix with the trumpet. Not for me. It, it altered your ability to I play. Thought, I thought I was playing better, but when I would hear tapes back, I would go, what on earth am I doing? I see. You know, it, may, it, may, it, it didn't work for me, mm -hmm. okay? And um, frankly, another thing that made me stop was when I was playing in, you can, alter, you can cut anything of this you want, but, um, I, but including saying you can cut any of this you want. <laughs> um, but um, I'm a little uptight because you're here and you're so young, but is it okay to talk about this? A I absolutely. Don't know. Okay. Yeah. Here, we'll just, uh, this is Emily. Hi, Hi Emily. Emily. Hi. 
She's a professional cameraman at 11. It's unbelievable. Okay. I, I can remember. This is all precluding when I, you know, it has to do with uh, what, what Jake did for me. Um, you know, I was a, you know, really well-practiced trumpet player when I was 21. You know, and one thing that kids don't understand is that you don't always have time to practice hours and hours a day and learn music that's going to be brought to you and play the show over and over again and this and that. When you get on the road with a band, like when I was on with Blood, Sweat and Tears, all of a sudden it was the road and we're traveling hours and hours and hours a day and there was less time to practice, frankly, although I did practice pretty diligently. But but when you're in school, you have more. That, that's when you have the most time to practice. Depending what school. Oh, okay. I have a bone to pick with schools that load you so up with academics that you don't have time to practice enough. And really, that's the only thing that's going to get you the gig is how much you practice right. and how well you practice. So at any rate, um, I know at this point it sounds like beating around the bush, but it isn't. Um, I remember playing the night the man, man the night that the people landed on the moon. There were six bands playing in a festival, including our band, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Miles Davis, Shoe Masekela, this and that. And I was talking to you about uh, Nina Simone, I can't remember the other two bands now, but I was talking to him about how, you know, the trumpet, you know, kind of felt weird, how I loved to smoke, but the trumpet kind of felt weird sometimes. And he said, Miles says, smoke shit, play shit. In other words, it doesn't work for everybody. On the other hand, one of the greatest lead trumpet players, I will not mention his name, uh, of the era, was high all the time, and he had a simple answer. If you want to play high, you got to practice high. <laughs> but at any rate, what I'm saying is, however people do things is, is another thing. I stopped smoking in 72 or 73, and I've never smoked since. So, you know, I'm not talking or advocating, and I'm advocating probably for trumpet playing, not doing it. Um, I'm certainly not doing anything that you can't moderate, and that's why I stopped. I couldn't moderate it, okay? So, in the midst of this period of smoking every day is when I went to see Jake. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my breathing was off a bit because I wasn't practicing and because I was, you know, smoking too much. He had a term for it, not smoking, but he had a term for it. Um, dissipating, I think he called it, in a way. Hmm. But at any rate, he explained some stuff to me. The most important thing that he said was, you know, his theories on breathing, you know, the ping pong ball machine, which I'm sure other people have talked about, measuring the capacity of my lungs, mm -hmm. all this. And he told me this was the, the key to what I learned from him. Uh, many keys, but this was one. I'd say the biggest one, the one that I teach to my students. And I would say I've only had one or two students that have listened to what I said about this in all my history of teaching. I can't remember more than two, possibly three. And um, when they don't listen, I just say, okay, well, I told you the secret, less competition for me. That's the way I think of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's just the truth as far as playing the horn. Jake told me that uh, at about the age of 50, there's a natural reduction in the inner organs of the body. And when I explain it to my students, I say, in other words, your lungs get smaller. Mm -hmm. So if you're not breathing correctly at that point, you're really going to get into trouble when you turn 50. And many players Jake helped, fantastic players in orchestras, who all of a sudden couldn't play as well when they turned 50. He helped them get it back. 
So is this, did he talk about the aging process when he yes. you saw him in 1969? Yes. And within the context of the aging process or within the context of smoking? No, I was smoking pot. I would never smoke cigarettes, never. And pot is nothing compared to cigarettes. Okay. Um, um, but he was talking about it in the context of every human being. Oh, okay. It gets smaller. Yeah. So he, he said he was going to teach me how to breathe correctly so this wouldn't happen to me. I see. And he also, the, the concepts that stand out were you have two trumpets, one in the hand, one, one in the hand, one in the head. Mm -hmm. And you don't really listen to the one in your hand. You listen to the imagination of what you want to sound like. You don't really listen to what's coming out of the end of the horn because then you're judging it. Mm -hmm. And if you make any statement and judge it, if you make any statement, how many minutes did you say? Four. Okay. If you make any statement and judge it at the same time, the, the, the statement loses its effectiveness. Like if I said, um, uh, the, 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 I think the lung does a natural reduction in the body when, um, when you turn around 50, uh, maybe I think, nobody's going to listen to what I say, yeah. but if I say there's a natural reduction in the inner organs of the body when you turn 50, Arnold Jacobs told me that, and he was an expert. Mm -hmm. Then you believe me. If you don't believe me, you're a fool. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, as far as I'm concerned, because it's the truth. Anyway, so, because Arnold Jacobs did a lot of medical research. Yeah, he did. And getting back to the horn in the hand, horn in the head, um, I also was suffering at that point from being a shy kid who was not ready to play in front of any celebrities or hmm. you know people that I thought were really you know particular people like Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, um, you name it they all came you know mm -hmm. almost everybody came to see this band and um, I was nervous to play in front of all these wow. people you know I mean come on man thousands of people at once I was a shy kid I, I'm not ready for this I need another 10 years of practice, Yeah, right? But there I am, thrown into it. Another 50 years of practice. <laughs> so at any rate, um, Jake talked, told me that I had to get away from, first of all, he showed me about mouthpiece practice. And what I see that's important in mouthpiece practice, and I still do it every day, I do 15 minutes on mouthpiece every day, wow. is that, oh, there were years I didn't, and but when I got back to it, it made a hell of a difference. Uh, it's easier to say, this is the sound I want to get, and not listen to your own sound when you're playing a mouthpiece. Because a mouthpiece doesn't sound good. Right, right. So you're, you're imagining a great tone on the trumpet, and then you play the mouthpiece, and, it makes, and after a while it makes your imagination freer to imagine that imaginary sound. I mean, he would say to me, okay, now think of Doc Severinsen, and you know, play your, play your mouthpiece, think of Doc Severinsen. Okay, now play your mouth, play your mouthpiece, think of Bud. Bud playing, Bud Herseth. Think of whoever you want to think of. Who do you want to think of? Think of this great player. And now think of the best tone you can possibly conceive of yourself yeah. and play the mouthpiece. Yes. But uh, I want to get onto this thing with the horn in the head and horn in the hand. Uh, for example, every trumpet player knows, every brass player knows that there are some days when you pick your horn up and all of a sudden the resonance is there like you're playing in the bathroom, even if you're playing in a closet. And another day, even if you're playing in a bathroom, nothing is happening and you feel like you're playing in a closet. And it just feels like there's somebody standing with their hand in front of your bell and you can't get anything going. 
Well, when I have a day like this, I usually don't now because I've done this so much in my life and I've learned to use my imagination. But if I do have a, a day, and any day I choose to do this, and I've done it with my students, it always works. Like I'll play a little excerpt with uh, Jake. He had me play. And I would play it on the trumpet. And then he would say, okay, now, take the mouthpiece in your left hand, finger it on the trumpet with your right hand, mm -hmm. and play it. And imagine one of your idols playing it. So I would do that. I would, I would imagine, I would go everywhere from Doc to Herseth to, um, to uh, I mean, the ones I would look at would be, it was middle register. So in that case, I wouldn't think of Maynard. Although now I might, because his tone is fantastic in the middle too. Mm -hmm. But I would think of the best, I would think of Shorty Baker. Mm -hmm. I would think of people, you know, with, with great mid register sounds and more on the classical style, which was where I came from at, at that time. I would think of, but I would also think of Miles Davis. I would imagine myself playing it, standing up and playing da 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 da, -da with a symphony orchestra, mm -hmm. standing up in time for the solo, and I would be in Carnegie Hall or Orchestra Hall, not Orchestra Hall, I would imagine Carnegie Hall or a big place and I would have to stand up and make it sound as beautiful as I could. And I would imagine that, this is after playing it once and it being nothing special at all. Then I would do this and then I would imagine myself on a jazz band stand playing it in the most, you know, like Miles Davis or something. And um, then I would imagine myself playing that same melody, uh, like in a big bravura style of Doc Severinsen doing it. I would imagine it uh, in a more delicate style. I would imagine it in every way I could. And then I would imagine it as you must, because you have to develop your own style, in the tone that I thought was the best tone I could get, which was not like these other guys. It was a combination of all of mm -hmm. them. And, and I would play it that way. And then after playing it, maybe I would always do it at least seven times, imagining different people in a mouthpiece. And then without thinking, that's the way he said to do it, without thinking, I would put the mouthpiece in the trumpet and play it. And I don't know if you've done this thing, but it's shocking. Yeah. It's shocking how much better it sounds. Yeah. Shocking. It, it, yeah. I had some of those moments in the studio with him that, that you're talking about. I hope somebody's done that for you on the tape. Oh, to, to uh, illustrate to illustrate that. No, we haven't had that. Well, you know, you might need a really good mic to pick up the difference, too. Yeah. You might need a real good audio mic to do that, but that's yeah. an idea. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think the, the phone, uh, the, the uh, whatever that little camera is, I don't think it would pick it up. It might not. The, 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 the audio the, part, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the incredible difference in the core of the sound that happens. Right. It's amazing. Well, it's always it was always amazing as a, as a, say, not only in the studio, but at a master class, let's say, watching Jacobs work with a student and doing this, this very same thing and then hearing the difference. Out so you know, audience. you know exactly what I'm talking. Yeah, about. of course. It's night and day. It's absolutely astounding, and it shows that the brain can turn it on at any time. Which brings me to another thing he told me. Before I'll get to the deepest thing, which is the breathing thing. He said, "Lou, he said when you play, you must think of the music. Because every time you play a note." Is like a, I remember the name, but there was a, the number, but there was 150 some odd things. I think it was 157 things that the body has to do 
every time you play a note. Wow. And he said to me, you remember this one? He said, a normal person can concentrate on one or two things at a time. That's a talented person can, count, can concentrate on two or three things at a time. A very talented person can concentrate on four or five things at a time. And a genius can concentrate on six or seven things at a time. <coughs> now, what he was talking about is, a, can you imagine if you're playing in a seven-piece ensemble and you can hear everything that everybody is doing at every moment? Mm -hmm. And track it. Yeah. No, in your mind, you can hear Oh, in your all, mind? In your mind. Oh, right. Hear everything. I see. At, at once. I don't think I can do that. You know, but what I'm saying is, and I, I always add, add it to myself, and I thought there were some super geniuses like Stravinsky who could probably hear a hundred things at once. You know, but at any rate, he, 157 is more than anybody can think of. Right. So the whole thing of make sure your throat is open, make sure your teeth are this, Make sure this, that, and when you think about all that stuff when you play, you're screwed before you start. You can't send the message out. You think of the message. Oh yes, there are certain exercises he would give us, like he would he gave me the old surgical tubing, which was about that big around. Mm -hmm. He told me to put it on top of my tongue and in between my teeth, mm -hmm. and I would take a few inhalations in that to get the feeling, the feeling of the backwards hole. Mm -hmm. I would conceive of air going through the Lincoln Tunnel. Mm -hmm. That's what I would consider. And the, the breathe, which brings me to the breathing exercise. And he said to me that if I practiced it every day for six months, it would become a habit and I wouldn't have to practice it anymore. So what did I do? I did what I tell my students to do. I practiced it three times a day. Before I played, somewhere in the middle of my practice, and at the end of my practice. I practiced it three times a day without missing a single day for a year. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I don't have to do it anymore. If I feel my playing going off, if I'm having a slump, I do it for a few days and it helps it come back. What was it that he, what was specifically did he tell you to do as far as the exercises? The breathing exercise? Yeah. Well, first of all, the syllable of the intonation, of, of the intonation, of the inhalation, the backwards hole, mm -hmm. because uh, he illustrated how ha, he, hi, who, ho is the most open. The, the, the important part of the breathing exercise, he explained that anybody could take in a first breath incorrectly and get enough air and you can take a first breath and like <laughs> you like that one okay so <laughs> no no I'm talking to his daughter what's your name Emily Emily, Emily. Emily. I'm talking to Emily okay but what I'm saying is but what about the illustration that I use with my students is play an eight bar phrase in one breath and then take the next breath in the last quarter or eighth note of that eighth in the bar phrase, then play another eight bar phrase, and then play another eight bar phrase. And if you're not able to take that inhalation in a split second, in full, every eight bar phrase you will take, your lip will be working harder, you'll be using probably more pressure, and it will make you fatigue and get tired so the trick is, in a split second, to take in a full breath of air. That's the purpose of his exercise. So the first thing he would do, which I, don't, I haven't had one of these in years, is take this piece. Now surgical tubing is very thin, mm -hmm. but it used to be smaller than the inside of a roll of toilet paper, which is too big. It was about a half inch. Or whatever it is, you can Diamond. find a little piece of plastic tubing when you're starting to do this. Put it over your tongue and between your teeth, it gives you the feeling of what it should feel like. The other thing that's very important about the breathing exercise is that the inhalations and the exhalations, this is all directly from Jake, be without any sound. In other words, the only sound would be of the air itself, as I say, the concept of concept, the concept 
uh, of, of pushing the air through the Lincoln Tunnel, the air just going by itself through the tunnel. For example, if, if you hear the teeth are in the way, if you hear the cheeks are in the way, if you hear the lips are in the way, everything has to be out of the way so that there's a clear passageway like this, not like this, but like this for the air to get down there in a split second. So you have to have all this in mind when you practice it. The other thing is it has to be relaxed. So the, 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 between the inhalation and the exhalation, there is no hesitation. In other words, it's not like in, out, in, out. It's not like that. It's like a circle. It's like in, out, in, out. It's like that with no hesitation. So it's totally relaxed. Um, there are two kinds of breath. I, I never understood why this works, but it works. He has you take 12 breaths. And you put one hand over your chest, you put one hand over your diaphragm. Um, and in the first series of 12 breaths, you do your best to keep the chest completely deflated, mm. not inflated. Has anybody talked about this in depth yet like this? No. Good. To me, this is the most important thing. Inflated, right? I mean, down. And then you take these series of 12 breaths with the syllable of the O, which is basically almost silent. In other words, if you hear sound, the more sound you hear, the more incorrect you're doing it. So I can't do it except by getting very close to the camera and going. I hope it comes out a little bit. And I was even exaggerating the sound a little so you would hear something on it. But it's basically silent. So you keep the chest down, you keep your hand on the diaphragm, and in this exercise you do 12 breaths in, where the, and I'm making more noise so you can hear it, in where the diaphragm goes out, and of course you notice I have plenty, <laughs> and then, and then out where the diaphragm goes in. The chest stays in the deflated position through the 12 breaths, but it has to be a circular movement, like in, out, in, out, without any moment of tension in between the inhalation and exhalation. And um, then there's a second exercise where when you breathe in, you expand your chest and you expand your diaphragm. You, as Jake said, you would get like a big bird and you would expand everything. And this one's much more difficult because after you expand it on your first inhalation, you keep your chest in the, in the expanded position and just move the diaphragm in and out. And you will never see it on this, but... But of course, I, I, I screwed it up by, by making too much noise on the way because I'm trying to illustrate it. But... And 12 of them. And the first time I tried to do 12 breaths, for Jake, I about fainted. And that was because I was smoking too much grass at the time. Okay. Not because I was high. I wouldn't walk into my lesson high. But it just, you know, anyway, after I did this for a year, as he told me to do it for six months, three times a day, and he said, never touch your horn while you're doing this. Keep the and, this bring, and this brings me back to the 157 things. What you do is you think about the music. If you think, if you have the conception of your sound and the music and what you want, the brain will coordinate all those 157 things and do the right thing to make the sound you want. Yeah. If you try to do it consciously, you are a word that I can't say on this, but you are screwed. Yeah. You can't do it. 
And um, um, it goes into a, a deeper thing that I didn't learn from Jake that I learned more later, which is, for example, in a book on spirituality. Mm -hmm. Not religion, but spirituality, where it said it was. Um, it was actually I was reading a book called The Practical Kabbalah by uh, Label Wolf, and well, there was something in there I can't remember how I interpreted it, but it said something like, the piano player who worries about how good or not he or she is, is cooked before they start. It's not about that. It's like the potter using the clay of the earth to make their pots and you know their their clay things. He said you're trying to you're, what you're trying to do is not be good or not. You're trying to share your love. The way I interpreted it, it was different words, but your love of the music. You're trying to share your love of the music. with others, with as many as you can. I mean, figuratively, although nobody can do it, with the universe. Mm -hmm. But that's what you try to do. You try to share your love of it. And, uh, and I think that when you play, you have to give. It doesn't matter how well you play your instrument. You don't tell a story and want to share it. What you play falls dead. I mean, it just, it doesn't matter how many fast you can play, how loud, how high, how soft. It's about telling a story. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jake also told me. You have to tell a story. Another thing he did with me, so I explained the breathing exercise. Mm -hmm. Don't touch your instrument when you're doing right. it. Keep the physical stuff away from it. The mouthpiece practice is great because it gets the imagination going. Did he have you practicing, just say, buzz tunes, or did he have you do drills on the mouthpiece? No drills. That was another thing. Thank you for saying that. Don't do drills. Play tunes. He would have me do deep knee bends. Remember that? Yes. He would have me walk in place to get the body loose yeah. so that my breathing wouldn't be tense when I would play. Right. And he would say, and he would say, and then I'll never forget this. Um, he, I played something for him once, and he said. Don't play for me like a student. What are you doing? And I said, but I am your student. He says, you're not my student. He says, you're not a student. You're a professional. I've heard you play. And this is why I say it was at the period where the record was big. Yeah. He said, I've heard you play. He says, he says when you play, you teach. Which mm -hmm. means, which means, which, which brings me to another one. But when you play a teach means when you make the statement through the horn, you can have no self-doubt about what you are doing. You just have to put it out there. If you want to criticize it, fine, but not while you're playing it. Like, for example, if I'm going, da 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 I can't da 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 If I'm going to do that, and I should be in a good posture to do it. da 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 If I'm going to do that, and I want to want to think of, as I was thinking of what it sounded like while I did it, because I'm not, you know, I'm not an experienced singer, with enough experience, but I do want to sing. And, but for example, if I try to do it another way, like, let's see. Da 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 I don't know what that was like singing wise, but I know it was more musical. Because I thought of the music more than I did of the of of the of singing the notes. Mm -hmm. And he said while you're doing it, you can't think about any of that but the music. After you play it, you can say, was that good? Wasn't it good? How can I make it better? After you play it. But why, if you do that while you're doing it, the whole power of the message is lost. I remember he would say, there should always be a period of time every day when you practice performing. 
turn on the microphone or the tape recorder to, to get, out, get out of the self-analysis while you're playing, to, well, to practice performing. To tell you the day. truth, you bring me other stuff. Basically, all the practice that I do now, with the exception of my warm-up, is all that way. Mm -hmm. You get much more out of playing than you do out of practicing. Mm -hmm. So you might as well practice playing. You know, I mean, that's, that's the thing. The whole thing is to approach everything like it's a performance. You know, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, instead of like, um, you know what you, da, 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 you know, you're going right out there. Mm -hmm. And if you want to learn something technical, I'm not the best at that. But, you know, you would do it slower. For me, my practice is mostly geared to improvisation. And, um, you know, after my warm-up, it's all improvisation. But then Jake, oh, Jake, when I first went to him, said, not more than 33% of your practice should be technical. The rest should be musical. Otherwise, I mean, there's a story. Um, 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 one guy I know hired a trumpet player who he heard practicing eight hours a day. Sounded great. Got him on the gig. Guy couldn't do anything because it was all tech, all about technique. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it got down to the point where like twenty percent technical and eighty percent musical. You know, the more musical, the better. Right. And that's the way Jake worked. And then he sent me the thing about when you play, you teach made me realize the power of the positive statement. No negative thoughts about what you're doing. Is this good enough? Is this good enough? Mm -hmm. And that's the way I fight when I play classical music because I don't play it enough to be, and I play equipment that conflicts with, with really fine tonguing and stuff like that. I have a problem, I get nervous playing classical music sometimes. I, it's much better than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And I know how much is involved with the particular equipment because I pick up another mouthpiece and I can do that, but then I lose my abilities to do other things. Mm -hmm. There's so much to do with the particular mouthpiece you use for the job. And uh, Jake said another thing to me that stuck with me as a teacher. And I believe nobody teaches anybody anything. The function of the teacher is to inspire the student to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is from a man who was as great a teacher as any I ever had. The only, you know, I mean, I studied with Bud Herseth, and I studied with uh, Ed Troidel, and many other great teachers. You know, many other great teachers, uh, you know, for different reasons. Uh, Carmine Caruso, Roy Stevens. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, these guys that concentrated on the music, I really think that's the key to everything, is concentrating on the music. And then... He said to me, um, and you might want to get a little of this. He said to me, "I want, I want, uh, I want Bud to hear you. I want to send you over to Bud." And I was like, uh, 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 "You know, Bud." First you know, thing that Bud Hurst had said when I walked into his studio, and he took me because Jake told him to take me. The first words he said to me, which I'll also never forget, he said, "I honestly believe that." I'm just joking. I remember. Uh, I honestly believe that um, if the musical motivation is high enough and the respiration is correct, the respiration is what Jake taught, a person can play anything they want to, can learn to play anything they want to. Mm -hmm. That's the first words he said to me. And then we talked a long time. And then he asked me to play for him. And man, I was so nervous. And he says, come on, it's good for you, you know? And then he asked me to play a Charlie Etude, number two, which I, I knew that book. I mean, I knew that Etude. Yeah. And um, I played some a little bit for him. And then I said, could you play it for me? And he played it for me, 
And then I played it better than I'd ever played it in my life after he played it. Did you have him in your mind while you played it? Of course, yeah. of course. And, and, well, I couldn't imitate him, but I said, and he said to me, one note is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. He said that to me. And then I, I used to study with him, I think it was once a month. I would fly out to Chicago. I had the money to do it because of the rock and roll thing. Mm -hmm. I'd fly out, stay in a hotel, have some great meals, and have a lesson with him, right? Mm -hmm. And Jake. So I would fly out, at, you know, at that point, a lesson with Jake was 20 bucks. 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. That's what he would charge me. I flew all the way out there. I don't remember. I think Bud was probably the same thing. I don't know. And no, they taught, they taught as I do. They taught because they wanted. Yeah. If they got a, a student that they that they saw was really listening, they wanted to help them. Yeah. And um, um, I didn't never notice a clock like thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I never noticed that. Yeah. And one of the reasons that it's hard for me to teach. Oh, we'll be done after this one. <laughs> one of the reasons that's a little difficult for me to teach many students is that when I get going with someone, I could give them hours, you know, sometimes. I just uh, am that way. On the other hand, if things are done in 45 minutes, we're done. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's however long it takes to get it across right. or to have the exchange. So anyway, um, the next thing that happens is... Um, I come back after a month, and he says, okay, play it for me. And I get ready to play, and I say, stop. I say, could you do me a favor? Could you just play it for me again? I kind of forgot some stuff. And he played it for me in an entirely different way than he played it a month before. And I said, wow. I said, well, you, he said, what? I said, no, I was going to ask you a question, but I already found the answer. I said, what's that? I said, well, you played it entirely different today than you did it last month. He said, of course I did, I'm in a different mood today. I said, and I was gonna ask you, do you want me to play it like you did last month or this month? And then I realized, you want me to play it my own way? And he said, exactly. And one time I said to Bud, I said, someday I wanna sound like you. And he looked at me and he said, no you don't. Someday you wanna sound like you. That's, That's what great he said question. to me. And um, I think I've covered a lot of what Jake said to me and what Bud said to me, and the, except to say that once in a while later, I would get in trouble. I didn't know what was wrong. He would always say, don't play by feel. If I would have a bad day where my lips were mashed up from what I did, yeah. and all of a sudden I couldn't do something simply like, da 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 and it would feel weird or awful, he would say, Lou, it doesn't have to feel like it felt yesterday. And this is Jake talking to you. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to feel like it felt yesterday. Just hear it and make it come out. So I would go into my mind, da, and I would play, and as weird as it felt, da, would come out. That's great. You know, and, and that's it. If we had a good mic, I know what I would do. I would play a little melody. We don't have a good enough mic. I would play a little bit of melody. I would play it seven to ten times on my mouthpiece, thinking of a different thing every time. And then I would pick up my horn and I would play it again. And even if it sounded good the first time, it would sound so much better and so much thicker with so many more harmonics in it after conceiving of that, that it would be, it would be, it's, it's, I know the way it feels is unbelievable. The projection, everything. Yeah. So here's my first notes on a 7C. And in, in uh, tribute to him, uh, you know what, what the whole interview is about, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to, I'm not going to try to sound bad, but. Um, I'm going to play the, the lick that we would always use to do this. Now for 
just to get up the horn, I'm not, I'm not unhappy with that. Mm, but I know that I have to warm up to make the muscles work right so that I'll have better endurance later. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to imitate various people in my head. Um, I'll start with Bud Herseth in his studio playing for me. And I think, was that, no, of course not, it didn't get close. Now I'm thinking of Doc Sevenson playing in a kind of a Barbara, Barbara, mm -hmm. Bravura style. Now I'm going to think of Miles Davis playing it in a small group. Occasionally what you can do to make sure you don't go off pitch is go, mm -hmm. you know, so you know that, um, if you can, for those of you who don't know what that is. That's a fundamental. The, the trumpet response to that. Now I will conceive of Bud again. But this time, I will conceive of him playing it as a solo with the Chicago Symphony on a stage. As you can hear, that was already a lot closer to what I'm trying to conceive. Now I will consider, conceive of myself playing it, because you have to be yourself. I will consider, consider of me playing it on a big stage in the middle of everywhere. Now I'm going to conceive of me playing it out over a lake. myself playing it under one of those big tunnel like bridges where the sound where the sound is echoing off the walls and now I'm going to conceive it and then I'm not going to say a word I'm just going to put the mouthpiece of the trumpet and play now I'm going to conceive myself playing it in a bathroom beginning I, I'm not you know I mean I'm I'm not bragging or anything but the first one I played right out of the box was good mm -hmm. you're hearing right right yeah. but the difference is there was without a doubt more thickness of tone mm -hmm. this time more thickness and if I were to go on with it for a while doing this kind of exercise for another 10 minutes the tone would get thicker and thicker and better and better and better. And that's the way it works. You went to Bud Herseth for music. You went to, to Jake to learn how to breathe. He helped so many people in the Chicago Symphony to keep playing. And I'll tell you something. 
he's the main reason probably. I, mean, I was set up with a good embouchure. Mr. Troidel told me when I was a young kid, he said, I'm not only concerned with, I want to bring Troidel into it because he's with embouchure, he said, I'm not only concerned with what you sound like, I'm concerned with how you produce the sound. He says, because there are many trumpet players that go out with Stan Kenton when they're 19, and by the time they're 21, they can't play anymore. Yep. You know, I don't want that to happen to you, Lou. You know? And so that's the way he was with me. And uh, then Jake, of course, with the breathing. Uh, so with Jake, it was, you know, the respiration. The other illustration I could do is to sing like, if you were to play, I'm in the mood for love, simply because, I mean, if you're going to play on the mood for love, I don't know if you know if anybody knows that song anymore, but I'm in the mood for love, breathe, simply because you're near me, darling, because you're near me, I'm in the mood for love. That's the way you would play it, but as an exercise, I would play it like this. I'm in the mood for love, simply because you're near me, darling, because you're near me. I couldn't do it. I'd have to use my breath more smartly and not sing, but let me try one time. <gasps> I'm in the mood for love, simply because you're near me, darling, because you're near me, I'm in the mood for love. Um, and then in that little one second, less than one second breath, you have to have enough breath and air to do it again. And that's what Jake taught us, is how to do that. So that our lips don't get tireder and tireder fast as the night goes on. And he helped many people in his uh, orchestra when they turned around 50 to do that. And I remember I went to a wedding and a bunch of the Chicago guys were there at the wedding. I was for somebody that was in the orchestra at the time. Since they got divorced, I'm not going to say who. But uh, I remember Larry Combs was at the wedding, this clarinetist. And I was jamming, sitting in with some people and playing. And he said, wow, he says, watching you play is like a per it's just like an illustration of the way Jake ter tells you to breathe. So what I'm saying is, that's why... I'm blessed to still be able to play. Mm -hmm. I can't play as fast as I did when I was a kid, you know? I don't have the physical strength I did when I was in my 20s or my 30s, of course not. But I can still play, and I'm, I can still play well. I've had to compromise on equipment, use a little smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. But because I've learned how to breathe correctly, I'm still playing at 70. And look, look at Bud. Yeah. Bud played first trumpet in the orchestra that was over 80. Yeah. It's about, it's about what Jake taught us. Bud, there are a few people that have it naturally. Bud just breathed that way. He breathed like that. Yeah. So he didn't need to be taught. But Jake studied this. Yeah. And you know things that I'm not going to say about Jake. You know the real personal stuff about how he was sick and all that. Yeah. And um, he had to learn to breathe correctly. Yeah, he did. I mean, play a contrabass tuba with not a lot of air to begin with. Yeah. He had to be very yeah. efficient. Well, you know, when you really know how to use your air, somebody like Emily could play a very loud high note on the trumpet with no problem. It's learning how to use your air. It really doesn't take a huge, huge, you know, yeah. it's, it's about efficiency. Well, 
we, Emily and I, are so grateful to you for Very welcome, allowing man. us to come in here. I'm, I'm grateful to have uh, the opportunity to say something about this man um, who was such a major help to me in my life and who the few times when my plane would go down, I would get with him and he would say, Lou, you have to practice the mouthpiece more, or something like that. That's simple. Yeah. And then I would do it, and everything would come back. I, 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 you're obviously uh, a lot of people tuning in will be remembering the obviously you, what you did as a have done and continue to do as a as a jazz artist, and then your time with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And and I think about that solo on Spinning Wheel. I've heard you say to other people in other interviews, I'm thinking of, in particular Michael Davis's interview with you on Bone Pig. That was a long one, huh? And um, two you hours, saw that? I watched every, every yeah. minute of it. And, uh, but but um, just to uh, you know, hear you think, you know, it was the second take, you didn't really yeah. think it was all that good a solo, but it was in so many ways, it was to that generation of trumpet players around the world that Louis Armstrong sold to West End Blues was to his generation. People caught him, but just copy Well, it. there's no, I mean, Louis Armstrong is, to me, the greatest trump player that ever lived. So I, I can't, I know you can't even really address that, but, except to say thank you. But I really believe a lot of it is as simple as this airplay. It's got airplay. Mm -hmm. People got familiar with it, they liked it. Yeah. Simple as that. Well, um, Emily and I, Puddles, Puddles we, we, have a, we come bearing a gift. We, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you this uh, genuine University of Oregon I don't, I don't, beverage dispenser. Sorry, I don't do that anymore. Oh, no, no, I'm just joking. It's a joke. It's a joke, okay? It's just paper. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke, all right? Okay. Thank you. And what's this, from Eugene? Yes, from Eugene. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah, uh, totally, totally a thrill for me. Thanks, thanks My, so much. Me too. Emily, thank you. Mm -hmm. And now back to you.